Good morning, everybody. I um, I don't know if you've all been up all night. In full disclosure, I haven't. But uh, in some circles, it's 6.30 in the morning in Chicago. So in some circles, this is pseudo uh, being up all night. Anyways, I'm very delighted to be able to introduce Rabbi Stephen Hankin. Rabbi Hankin serves Congregation Agudat Achim in Savannah, Georgia. And I know we all look forward to, um, to your teaching this morning. So take it away. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. I'm a native Chicagoan too, so I understand. So, uh, good to have good to have a Chicagoan friend with us. Chag um, Sameach, everybody. Tafra Tava. Good morning. Uh, glad y'all are joining us wherever and whenever you are joining us in this process, um, and uh, glad to be teaching with y'all. Um, so uh, before I start teaching, and we put the. Uh, uh, PowerPoint up. Um, I just want to give a little background into how this came about was I actually put this she or this class together last year um, towards still I guess in the middle early stages of the pandemic when we were trying you know I, I think I like a lot of people were trying to figure out what this meant how did I how to find comfort during all the uh, amidst all the chaos and all the stress that was going on. And as a rabbi, I, I found comfort in some particular texts that uh, I hold dear. So um, I wanna share some of those texts today, whether it's as we're now facing the stresses and anxieties of reopening and going back into the world, um, or just any everyday stresses that we might have. I wanted to share some of these texts in the hope that um, they can provide comfort for you and others as well. So uh, if we can put the uh, PowerPoint up, um, we'll kind of go from there. Um, you can go to the next slide and I'll kind of go from, read from there. So the first text I wanna talk about is uh, from Kedushat Levi. Um, I personally find a lot of my comfort in Hasidic texts. So that's kind of where I naturally go. Um, and uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the individuals, more for time's sake, uh, since we are on a strict schedule here. But uh, he, uh, Reb Levi Yitzchak Berdichev was one of the more influential uh, leaders in Hasidic thought. Um, and you can see there's some introduction there. Um, and I am grateful to Rabbi Lawrence Kushner, who, I'm, who I learned this text from, um, and uh, who got me into this teaching. The tzaddik, the leader, the rebbe, the righteous one, who serves Hashem needs to always know that when he or she achieves some spiritual level, there's another, another level above that one which has not yet been achieved. This level is not the goal of wholeness, since he or she constantly knows that since there is still something lacking, he or she has not received, achieved wholeness. And when one comes also to this next level, he or she should know that there's yet still another level in front of that and in front of the next one. There is no end to this, since all who achieve a spiritual level know that he or she still has not achieved wholeness, and the level above this one requires still more wholeness. But he or she still cannot attain it, and always knows that he or she is not whole, and what he or she is lacking. So, I, I will say, every time I have taught this text, I have gotten massive backlash from people who get very upset that you know, what's the point then, right? Like, uh, if if I can't do it, if the goal is never achievable, then why try? Um, you know, if, if I can't ever achieve my goal, then what's the point of any of this? And I think that's actually exactly what Reb Levi Yitzchak is saying, is the point isn't to achieve a specific goal. The goal is not to become perfect, to become better, to become smarter, to become stronger, to become um, anything. The goal is to be on the path. And the goal is to be on the journey together. So that there's parts where you move forward, you move ahead, and you always want to keep moving ahead but there's a level of humility involved in this as well to know that, okay, I've, I've now grown, I've now, now changed, I've now become better, 
but I still have room to grow. And I always will have room to grow. I've always said that, you know, the moment that I think I have, I have being a rabbi down pat is the moment I should probably stop being a rabbi because I can't do it anymore. Because, you know, if, I, if, you're, if you think you're perfect, if you think you've got it all figured out, you're in trouble. Um, and I think that's a little bit of what Reb Levi Yitzchak is saying is there's a level of growth that constantly needs to be happening. And if you're not, if you're not achieving that, if you're not growing with it, then, um, then you're not going anywhere. You're not advancing. Um, so when... I put the, I titled this section when struggling to meet your own expectations. So, you know, when you're struggling to meet your, when you're not doing what you want, just remember it's part of a process. It's part of a journey. It's part of a path that you're walking on. And you'll get there or you'll at least strive to get there, but it's going to take time. And every time you get, think you got there, there's going to be another step for you to take. And so embrace not the goal, but the process and journey of getting there. Um, I could probably teach on this text uh, for at least the next half hour, but I'm going to go on to the next one, um, which if we go to the next slide, it's uh, when struggling with change. This is a text that um, my synagogue re used to read every morning um, in the B'yuchot HaShachar section, because it was, it was in the... Uh, the old Seem Shalom for weekdays, and it's still in the Seem Shalom for Shabbat and festivals. So now we just read it every Shabbat. But, <laughs> um, but you know, you read a text sometimes, oh, every time, and you're like, okay, I know what it says. And then something happens, like, I don't know, a global pandemic. And you look at this text again and say, wow, I, I missed something there. Um, and that's kind of the experience I had with this particular text is, um, at one time, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was walking from Jerusalem, and his disciple, Rabbi Yoshua, was walking behind him when he saw the temple in ruins. Rabbi Yoshua said, Oi for us! I love that. Even, even Rabbi uh, Yoshua was saying, Oi. Um, Oi for us that this place that we used to atone for Israel's transgressions through sacrifices has been destroyed. Rabbi Yochanan said to him, My child, do not grieve. There's another way we can gain atonement that is just as good. What is it? Acts of loving kindness. As it is said, loving kindness I desire, not sacrifice. On its surface, I think this is a beautiful teaching and fits in a lot of prophetic teachings and fits a lot of what I think a lot we, we like to hold on to that. The ritual side is important for Jewish life. I'm going to put that out there as a conservative rabbi. I kind of feel like I have to say that. The ritual side is important, but ultimately what God wants of us is gemilut chasadim, acts of loving kindness, to be good to each other, to treat each other well, to treat each other fairly, to be nice to each other. Um, and great. And I think that's a wonderful um, teaching in and of itself. But when I was looking at this text more carefully, there's something really powerful in this statement. Uh, if you know the history, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was not just, you know, a, one of the heads of the Sanhedrin. He was also the one responsible, according to the Talmud, for getting out, establishing the rabbinic, um, the rabbinic academy at Yavne, and in that same Midrash, kind of letting the Romans in to destroy the temple and to destroy Jerusalem. Um, great classic story of him getting smuggled out by his students in a coffin and going to the emperor and saying, give me Yavne and I'll give you Jerusalem. They agree. And sure enough, um, Jerusalem falls and Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai gets Yavne and establishes rabbinic Judaism from there. Putting that story into this context, you, it, you kind of get a very different sense of what's going on here. Rabbi Yochanan is walking past Jerusalem, and Rabbi Yoshua looks back and says, not just looks at the temple in ruins 
and not just longs for a return to the sacrificial service, but longs for going back to the way things were. And I know I hear a lot about that. I'm sure a lot of the rabbis who have been around have heard a lot, and the chazanim have heard about. I just want things to go back to the way things were. I just wish things could go back. You know, I miss doing this. I miss doing that. I miss doing this other thing. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai kind of says, stop. That's not happening. We can't go back. It's done. This pandemic is done. Not yet, unfortunately, but it's getting there, God willing. Going back to the way things were before the crisis is completely missing the point. Um, I was part of another tikkun last night on Zoom in which uh, you know, one, of, uh, one of my colleagues, Rabbi Alon Ferenzi, kind of said, you know, if you, miss, if you don't learn from this, then you've kind of wasted your opportunity. Um, there's a lot of lessons we can learn. And, you know, we don't want to, a time of crisis is not a time to waste the opportunity to learn. Um, and I think that's kind of what Rabbi Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai is trying to say is, okay, it's done. Sacrificial system's gone. Yes, we can mourn over it, but the time for mourning has passed. Now, what can we learn and what can we go? And I think he's here setting the stage and setting the point of um, rabbinic Judaism to say, sacrifices is not what we're going for anymore. Now we're going for kindness. And in times of extreme change and in times when things are all in upheaval and when we're struggling to move on, I think this is a wonderful guide is the past is the past. When we're in crisis, we're in crisis and changes are necessary to survive. But whatever changes you're going to make, let kindness be the guide in leading it. Let kindness be your leader in this to help you through whatever crises and changes you are going to have to make. Um, and that's how Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai uh, founded Rabbinic Judaism on that principle. And I think that's a good principle for us to take as well. Um, let's go on to the next slide. Um, This is another text which um, I, I often get in trouble with when I try teaching it. And nonetheless, I'm going to uh, <laughs> try to teach it today, this morning. Um, it is a somewhat problematic text, and I will uh, will explain why. It's a, it's a text from Rebbe Nachman of Breslov, um, one of the great known Hasidic Rebbe's. Um, uh, the founder of the Breslov movement and uh, the Uman Hasidic community. Um, a very fascinating character in and of himself. If you haven't read any of the biographies on him, um, a fascinating individual um, and his path to become a, becoming a Hasidic Rebbe. Um, this is a snippet from one of his teachings, which he says, falsehood, which is evil, which is impurity, is caused by distance from oneness. For evil is contrariety. For example, something that opposes a person's will is considered evil. But in oneness, contrariety doesn't exist. All is good. Let that sink in for half a moment here. Um, so, so what's Rebbe Nachman saying? He's saying that what we define as evil is usually something that opposes what we want. So that if it's not what we want, it's automatically bad. However, God, who we know from the Shema, God is one. Um, if God is one and God is good, then necessarily everything that happens has to be good. That's kind of the philosophical uh, 
philosophical train that Rebbe Nachman's thinking on here um, is that God is one, God is good, so therefore everything God does is good, which is an admittedly very difficult, very problematic theology to have, especially post Holocaust. But I think um, I think all of us have been around long enough and lived enough of our lives to realize um, it, it just doesn't work that way, right? Like how many, the classic theodicy question of um, why do bad things happen to good people? Rabbi Harold Kushner made a, made a, made a living off of bands trying to tackle that question, um, to which there is no good answer for the record. <laughs> but, um, So, yes, I am aware that theologically this is a problematic um, theology. So let's acknowledge that and put that aside for a moment. On the flip side, there's a way that we can look at the world that even not from a theological point, but from a personal point. When things do seem awful, when things are going bad, when we are in a crisis, there, as I kind of mentioned before, there is an opportunity here as well. Not in a sense that God is sending us this crisis to teach us something or to teach us a lesson um, or to punish us, but that just the nature of being in crisis allows us some reflection and allows us to think about what we can learn and how we want to change going forward. So uh, I'll give my kind of personal example from this is that, you know, during the early stages of the pandemic, um, I, I didn't have to stay up for two hours after the, my kids went to bed learning Torah reading, which I was doing for, you know, the years previous to the pandemic is I'd, I, my kids would go to bed by 8.39, I'd sit down with a tikkun and I'd immediately start learning Torah and for, to laying on Shabbat. And uh, during the pandemic, I didn't have that problem. We weren't going to synagogue, wasn't reading from a Torah scroll. So what did I do? My wife and I sat down and watched Netflix or Disney Plus. And I realized, man, I missed this. You know, we used to do this all the time. I, we haven't done this in years. And there was a certain beauty to being able to recapture that. Um, and I like, I have some extra time because I'm, you know, not going to the office doing things. I started working out uh, at home. So, and I started doing things to take better care of myself. Things that I probably wouldn't have done because of the pandemic, uh, until the pandemic caused me to rethink things. Um, and I think that's what I want as a, as the message to take away from this is, look, I, I don't want to minimize the awfulness of the, the, hor the horror of the pandemic or the tragedies that it has caused because it has exacted a horrible toll um, from many of us, both physically, spiritually, psychologically. But I want to ask whether there is a possibility when we're struggling through these kinds of crises, whether we can take a step back to reflect and say, what can I learn from this? Um, what can I take away to, to learn something good? And is, is there something good that can come from this? Not because God is forcing us to, but because we have to force ourselves to, to be able to move forward in a productive way. Um, and so what can we learn from this to take with us to when the crisis is over? And what can we continue to incorporate into our new lives that are necessarily, as I said before, going to change because of this. Uh, we're going to go to our last text. I think I might have timed this just perfectly enough to be able to get to all of them. Um, 
Our last text comes from the Eish Kodesh, who another Rebbe that I have a lot of affection for. Um, if you don't know uh, Rabbi Shapira, he of Piasetsna, he uh, was taught in a Hasidic community outside of Warsaw before World War II. Um, and then that community was sent into the Warsaw ghetto where uh, he continued secretly writing and teaching Torah um, until he was sent to a work camp where um, it, he passed away. Um, and this, you can see March 14th, 1942, this teaching is a segment of a teaching um, when things were getting clearly pretty bad inside the ghetto. Um, and he teaches, and he begins by citing uh, the Talmud from the Sechet Chagiga. It mentions, in the outer chambers, strength and gladness in God's place. And in the inner chambers, God is sorry and weeps, as it were, for the pain of Israel. Therefore, at the time of God's concealment, that is to say, when the Holy One is hidden in the inner chambers, a Jew is alone with God there, each according to his or her own level, and there it is revealed to him or her Torah and prayer. So, this in itself is kind of a powerful statement um, that in, in typical rabbinic thought, um, when, when things are going badly, when there is a crisis, the, the idea is that God is concealing, God is hiding. And God, we, that's why we often pray for God to turn God's face to us or to um, God, we pray for God to be with us so that God is facing us and when good things will happen. But he kind of suggests here that God isn't, that's not the cause, that's the effect. That when things are really going that badly, when thing, there is a crisis, God retreats inside God's, in God's innermost chambers. Imagine God has a giant palace in heaven. God retreats inside and starts crying and weeping for God's people that are suffering. But that we have an ability to, to weep with God in those moments. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll read a little more about that. But as we mentioned above, the blessing one is found in the inner chambers and cries. When one who is suffering presses and approaches God with Torah, that person cries with the holy blessing one and learns Torah with God. This is the difference. One who cries, is in pain, is sorry about his or her pain and suffers alone, can be broken and fall because of it until he or she is unable to do anything. But the crying one does with God together strengthens the person. That person cries and is strengthened, broken, but strong enough to study and pray. It's hard not to read this and kind of think of what his own psychological uh, position was at this moment that he was writing this. Um, but there's a, an ability here that he's, what he's kind of saying is, when you're in this kind of crisis, as he clearly was, and his people clearly were in the ghetto, there's a point at which you want to say, I can't do this anymore, I'm done. Forget it. And he says, that approach is a, it's a legitimate approach. Um, you can, but then you, you're alone. And when you're alone in your suffering, you're going, to, you're going to crack. There's nothing left. You can't go anywhere. You won't be able to grow. You, won't, you can be broken and fall because, until you won't be able to do anything. I suspect he was aware of quite a few of his own con members and congregants who were in that position at the time. And he's speaking directly to them. Um, and he saw it happening. And I think we've seen it happening with people who have just kind of given up um, during this pandemic. Um, but 
there's a place here where God is inside God's chambers crying. And when we're suffering, when we're alone, and when we're willing to make the effort to continue to reach out to God with that, with that pain, with that suffering, with that loneliness, then we're not so alone anymore. Um, there's a level here where God is suffering with us when things are going badly. Um, and God is crying along with us for the tragedies and the pain and the suffering that's going on in this world so that we're not alone. That when there's a tendency when, we, when we're really going through something traumatic that we feel like we're by ourselves and nobody else can understand us. And I think what Rabbi Shapir is trying to teach us is you're not. You're right. There might, other people might not be able to understand what you're going through in that trauma, but God does. And if you're able to reach out to God on whatever level, whatever ability you can, um, God will be able and willing to sit and cry with you to help you be there. And sometimes that's all you need. Uh, anyone who has suffered a loss knows that sometimes you don't need resolution. Sometimes you don't need um, an answer. Sometimes you just need a friend to sit there and cry with you. And when nobody else can do that, he's trying to offer that God is still willing to do that with you. And you can still be strengthened and strong enough to continue and to continue on your journey, to continue on your path, even in those moments. So um, that's all the text I have for today. Um, just as a little bit of a tie everything together, that um, some things we can do when we're in these kinds of moments of trauma, these moments of crisis, is we can recognize that this is a, this is a part of a journey. It's not an eternal part um, that we can, we're hoping to move forward, but well, even every step of the way is going to be another step. And you know, right now people are saying, oh, the pandemic is over. Well, guess what? There's still more steps to take to finish the pandemic uh, before it'll truly be over. And even then, will there be more steps to take to, for moving forward beyond that? So there's always going to be somewhere more to move, but wherever you're moving, do it with kindness. Do it with a, from a place of love and respect for other people and trying to um, love and protect each other. Um, and for personally, on a personal level, do it in a way that you can, um, you can try to learn something from the crisis and know that if all else fails, if you're really struggling, that God is still with you and supporting you during that time. So I want to wish everybody a Chag Sameach. Um, I'll be getting ready for services soon, so I look forward to seeing you at Mount Sinai momentarily, um, but wishing you all the best for a meaningful uh, rest of your Tikkun and a uh, rest of your Shavuot. So Chag Sameach, and uh, thank you for learning with me. Chag Sameach, thank you so much for the beautiful, inspirational teaching timed perfectly in your time slot. Um, it was really, it was really inspiring. Um, I'm sure for all of us that are, you know, living through this year and thinking about the next transition. So Chag Sameach, and Thanks. we'll give it just a minute to be precisely on time um, to introduce our next speaker. Deborah. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Looking forward to, uh, to your teaching this morning. I'm going to introduce you to the group.